Thank you, Pastor Dan. Join with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, what a privilege and joy to come together to read your word and to learn more about you, O Lord. And so, Lord, uh, we submit Pastor Dan into your hand as you provide your wisdom to him, O Lord, as he brings your word. So, Lord, rest of the study, we submit into your hand. And, Lord, we pray for all those who are planning to join, to, to come and join so that they can uh, they can take advantage of the study, O Lord. And we pray for your Holy Spirit to reveal, O Lord, and to open our hearts and transform us, O Lord God. And so, rest of the study, we submit into your hand. But thank you and bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Sachin. Welcome again to all of you. Vanessa has just joined us. Uh, and Franklin Poppins has uh, mentioned uh, uh, that he was uh, going to look for the inspiration and the infallibility. <laughs> so hopefully he'll join us too, right, in just a moment. Okay. Um, all right. Let's uh, uh, get into the study for today. And uh, the, uh, the subject I've chosen, actually, I was thinking... I was later inspired to maybe make this into a series, and that is the how the Old Testament proves that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Messiah, the one who was, you know, has indeed become our Savior uh, and the Savior of the world. So uh, there are some very interesting prophecies, and I found this one in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, and also the other one in Isaiah 53, these are all, uh, you know, very powerful messianic prophecies. Uh, there are some in the Psalms. And so maybe I thought I'll pick up a few and uh, make this more like into a series. But obviously today we will just deal with uh, Genesis 22. And uh, I thought uh, since we just celebrated or I should say commemorated and celebrated uh, the crucifixion, the resurrection, um, and those of us who remember that uh, specific events on those days, uh, it was a declaration of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Christ and he is the Savior of the world. Uh, and so just to sort of continue in that same momentum, of Christ being our Savior. What does the Old Testament have to say? And the proof of Christ being the Messiah is also prophetic. And the Old Testament scriptures indeed are very, very rich in that. Uh, we are absolutely certain that a Messiah was promised by the Old Testament scriptures. And so it is further proof of our belief and gives us confidence as we look at these scriptures from the Old Testament, how Jesus Christ has indeed fulfilled every one of them. Uh, so today we are going to look at Genesis 22, and you will probably remember the very famous story about Abraham and Isaac. Abraham being asked to uh, sacrifice Isaac, and there are some interesting uh, coins, you know, a correlation that we can make. Now, the whole act of sacrifice that God asks Abraham to make, you could say, as some uh, as some scholars uh, sort of uh, term it, prophetic enactment. It is a prophetic enactment. In other words, it's a an event or a story that fits very well with. Uh, what was to come, and that is prophetic in nature. For example, you know, Jeremiah, the prophet, is asked to smash jars before an audience. Right? Uh, Ezekiel, baking bread over human waste. I mean, specifically, uh, he being asked to bake bread over human waste. Uh, Isaiah walking around naked for three years. And these are all prophetic enactments, you know. Uh, Hosea being asked to marry a harlot. Uh, they are uh, very uh, picturesque. They are extremely, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, very, very uh, uh, 
what do you say, vivid in its message that is being given to the audience, right? You could say they are non-verbal actions and objects intentionally employed by the prophets so that the message content was communicated to the audience. So Genesis 22 is one of those. And uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection has reference in these passages. Now, a question may come to mind, and that is, we might ask the question, are we force-fitting some of these specific details into the events of you know, the resurrection uh, and the crucifixion? Uh, my answer to that is, you know, uh, well, one is that there are too many coincidences, you know, <laughs> too many coincidences uh, for us to say that they are force fit. Uh, for me, it seems very obvious that God is trying to say something through this event. Uh, and when we look at how Jesus Christ fulfills each one of those, uh, I I have a feeling that uh, uh, they they are they are not necessarily force fit. Uh, so we can talk about that a little bit more down the line. Uh, but I feel that God does have a purpose for humanity. He has decided to work out His purpose for humanity in a particular manner, and of course, in and the particular manner is the person of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure he would give us enough information, enough, what you say, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, pictures to show that indeed he is fulfilling his purpose through Jesus Christ our Lord, right? Okay. All right. Having said that, let's go straight away to Genesis 22. And I'm going to share my screen with you here so that uh, we can... It, it, it can become just a little bit more vivid as we read the scripture for ourselves uh, and we can make it uh, much more picturesque. Okay, let me just, uh, give me just a moment as I get this onto the screen. All right. Um, well, that's the title message, The Promised Messiah, Study of Genesis 22. What I would like to do is to read the narrative. Sometimes it helps to just read the narrative i'm sure you already are quite familiar with it but nevertheless just catch let's catch the words that are used to describe this i am reading this from the new international version so uh, let me just get my yeah okay so i am going to read the narrative from genesis 22 and uh, hopefully you can uh, follow along all right okay beginning in verse 1 sometime later God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he says, here I am. He replied, here I am. Uh, the Hebrew, I think, is Hineni. And there is a song <laughs> that goes with this Hineni. Uh, so I don't know if you've heard it, but uh, uh, that's very interesting. Carrying on in verse 2, then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place called, uh, the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Carrying on in verse 6, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide 
the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Carrying on in verse 9, when they reached the place God had told him about, about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram, and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So that is the, uh, the, the portion I wanted to read. And so we, uh, like, you know, we understand the story. Uh, Abraham lived at a time when there was a lot of unbelief around. If you remember the story from the Genesis chapter 3 onwards, you know, a lot of distrust on God, unbelief with God. And what happens when unbelief reigns in the world? It allows for evil to manifest itself. And as it builds on itself, evil builds on itself, the world becomes even worse and worse and worse, right? It leads to more deception, misrule, mismanagement. And of course, it ravages the world with violence and death, especially violence, right? So it almost seemed like if he, if he just catch, catching up the story from before, God had to delay this movement of his, of bringing humanity into, into the fold of the Trinitarian reality. God had to delay the movement towards fulfilling that purpose by scattering the nations. If you remember Genesis uh, uh, chapter 11, is it, where he uh, uh, have to literally scatter the nations, confusing them through languages. You know, in, in God's perspective, he thought that the earth was destined towards destruction because every thought of humanity was evil. And especially uh, being manifested by violence. So in all of this, God then chooses this one man, Abraham, chosen to be the one through whom the covenant promises would be then fulfilled. And it would be through a special son, right? And we know that Isaac was very special to Abraham because Abraham knew it was a miracle that he had even Isaac as a son. Uh, if you remember the story, Abraham and Sarah were well past the age of childbearing and having a child. And so God's provision of a son, uh, you know, for them in their old age. And so you, we begin to see how God had intended to bless the world, bless humanity. But unfortunately, humanity just, you know, did not trust God and went their own way. But here was Abraham who believed, who trusted God. Of course, he failed at times in trusting God. But nevertheless, God, you see, values, I may have said it before, God values very much when one trusts him and one conducts his life according to uh, the belief and the faith he had, that he has in God. So after all of this, then comes the test, the big test, right? Uh, Abraham is told, to sacrifice this son, whom he believed was a miracle that he even had him. And thus unfolds this unique story that gives us a glimpse into how God decided he would redeem the world. Okay, so now, having uh, just painted that picture, I want to pick up some specific passages from what, from the narrative that we have read. 
and then see how we can uh, recognize its prophetic nature and its prophetic enactment, like I said earlier. All right, so let's pick up the first one uh, in verse 2, where it says, Then God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Now, one of the questions that comes to mind, and, may, and this is just an aside, is that here is God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son. And the question that we might have is, does God promote or does God want human sacrifice? That's a question that lots of people ask, you know. And uh, now, if I obviously don't have time to go into that. In fact, I was just thinking to myself, maybe we should make it a Bible study and maybe we'll pick it up later. But just to answer that question, does God require human sacrifice? Uh, through Isaiah, this is no, not Isaiah, but through Jeremiah, this is what he says. I'm reading from Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 31. He says, they have built the high places of Tophet, uh, which is in the valley of the son of Hino, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which, notice, which I did not command, and it did not come into my mind. Right? This is how God, uh, through the prophet Jeremiah, says that, Far from it that God would want human sacrifice, right? Uh, uh, I just offer that as an answer to the question that may come to our minds. Does God want human sacrifice? He says, it doesn't even come to my mind. But yet, there is something, you know, so ironical here that God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. Nevertheless, I'm going to leave it that there, obviously, that's going to take some time and we will do it as another study. But the fact that God stops Abraham, we know the story. God stops Abraham from killing the son is indicative of God's intention that, yes, he was not wanting Abraham to ultimately sacrifice his son. All right. Now, let's look at, uh, notice it says, take your son, your only son. Right. What does that remind us of? Your one and only son, whom you love. Now, that's very interesting. Notice it says, whom you love. <laughs> and this is probably one of the first passages in the Bible that uses the word love. And it is given in the context of a father and son relationship. Right. Uh, perhaps indicating the perfect archetype for sacrificial love. Right. Maybe there is some something that we need to recognize there. So it, the word love comes in there. But notice it says, your one and only son, your only son. Should remind us of the scripture, right? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The word, the Greek word, monogenes. One and only or begotten son. If you read the King James Version, it says, God's begotten son. It has the same meaning that he is unique. This son is unique, right? Uh, uh, he is not like the other sons that God has. And we know through the scriptures that, uh, you know, that the supernatural world of, of spirit beings are also called sons. In fact, they're also called Elohims. But mm. Yahweh is the only distinct yellow Elohim, right? And so here when he says, your one and only son, is it a pointer to something that God himself would provide, right? Even as the narrative says that God provides. So here is uh, one indication that this is a pointer to what would come later in the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord, being the one and only son uh, in terms of being unique in terms of, you know, uh, not the, like the other sons. But Jesus would sacrifice himself for the world. Okay, that's one thought I would uh, 
6.2. Let's look at another one. This is verse 3. Here it says in verse 3, Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. And notice on verse 4, which I've highlighted, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Does this ring a bell? The third day? Well, if you look at Luke 18 and verse 32, Jesus says, He will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. <laughs> Coincidence? Well, I think not. It probably has a very uh, unique significance that Abraham would arrive on the third day. And on the third day, the son is delivered, right? All this while, the intention was to kill the son. But on the third day, this son was indeed delivered, right? So that's another pointer to the uh, enactment, the prophetic enactment. Let's look at another one and let's go to uh, verse 5 now. Uh, here in verse 5 it says, He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Did you notice that he includes Isaac of coming back? We will worship and we will come back to you. Why, why does Abraham include the boy? Why does Abraham, why is he so confident? I mean, it looks almost arrogantly confident that Abraham would include Isaac to actually come back after worshiping when he knew that he was to kill him as a sacrifice. Well, we are given uh, an understanding of that in the book of Hebrews, and let's just go there quickly. In the book of Hebrews, we are told why Abraham had the confidence. Notice it says in Abraham, uh, sorry, in Hebrews 11 verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Right. Uh, verse 19, Abraham responded that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. That is the that is how we have been told Abraham had confidence that even though something would happen to Isaac, he would God would raise him up. Raise him up. What does that remind us of? <laughs> Jesus Christ our Lord, on the third day, he would be raised up, right? So in one sense, Isaac was a dead person because Abraham had determined to kill him from the day he started the journey. But uh, the sparing of him, when God told, don't kill him, it became like a resurrection, right? And it happened on the third day, all right? All right, let's move on. And I have, I'm going to pick up in verse 6 now. In verse 6, it says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. Does that make any sense? Uh, would it make any sense for us? Uh, why would the, the wood be placed on, the, on his son Isaac? Well, if you read John 19 and verse 16, it says, So the soldiers took charge of Jesus Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Just as Isaac was carrying the instrument of death, the wood, Jesus also was carrying the instrument of death on his shoulders. Uh, I can't, I mean, <laughs> coincidence, I really wonder. Uh, such precise coincidence is uh, engineered in, 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 indeed. All right. Okay. Uh, let's look at uh, a few more and then we'll come to a conclusion. 
I go to uh, verse 7, picking up from part of verse 7. It says, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Verse 8, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went together. All right. Now, uh, the uh, what happens after that? You know, when uh, Abraham says God provides, and indeed God provided because God stopped Abraham from killing Isaac. And immediately when he lifted up his eyes, what did he see? Let's just pick up that story in verse 13. Same chapter. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. What is a ram? A ram, according to, you know, not that I'm a shepherd or a, or a farmer, but uh, through, you know, whatever I could read, it is a male lamb. And of course, we know Jesus was called the Lamb of God. So the ram goes in place of Isaac. Right? The ram goes in place of Isaac. Jesus went in our place, in our stead. Does it correlate? There was one, something provided. But, but then you say, why was not lamb provided? Why was a ram provided, which had two horns? Well, <laughs> the ram needed to be caught somehow. Uh, but no, actually, there is something interesting here. And uh, notice it says, the ram was caught in a thicket, which is like a thorn bush. They are full of thorns, right? And it was not able to extricate itself from the thorn bush. A thorn bush? Does that ring a bell? A crown of thorns? Does that make any sense? Like somebody said, the ram was, you know, we had thorns on its head or caught the horns were caught in its head, uh, in its in its horns. And some would like to, it to believe that it was like a crown of thorns on the ram's head. Now, the ram has two horns, all right? Does that make any sense? According to one scholar, his name, he, he calls himself Sam Shamoon <laughs> for some reason. Um, he says that the ram having two horns has a symbolic meaning. And he refers us to Revelation chapter 17. In Revelation 17 and verse 12, it says, The ten horns you saw are ten kings. Horn, king. In other words, horn is symbolic of a king. Horns are symbolic of kingship. Jesus was the king of the Jews, as was actually written on the uh, on the placard that was hung on the cross. But two horns? Is it possible that Jesus could have, I mean, could be king of the Jews and the Gentiles and the whole world? I mean, at least that is that is a wild speculation, I would say. But nevertheless, it has a, some, some ring of truth to it in terms of when we, when we bring Jesus Christ into it. All right. Okay. I'm coming to one more thought, and then we will have some reflection. Uh, and that is uh, verse 14. Here in verse 14, it says, So Abraham called the place that the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Very interesting that, it, uh, it, uh, that the wordings seem to indicate something uh, where you want to anticipate something, you see. To this day, you know, it, it is uh, added here. It is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. So there is some anticipation in what is uh, recorded there in the scriptures. Now, very interesting. What is this? Um, what is the significance of the mountain and the fact that the Lord will provide? Uh, some scholars have put these two together, and uh, this one, along with Second Chronicles chapter 3. You know, Solomon builds a temple, and where does he build it? 
let's just let me just give you Second Chronicles chapter three, and I'm I got it on the screen. Beginning in verse one, it says, "Then Solomon began." Oh, where is this now? Yeah, then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. It was on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, the place provided by David. Notice Mount Moriah. If you remember, when we read in the narrative, Genesis 20, uh, sorry, Genesis 22, yes, uh, in verse 2, it says, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, Go to the region of Moriah, right? Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain. I will show you. Now, is it possible that Isaac's sacrifice took place at the same place where the temple was built? Because it says here in Second Chronicles that the temple was built on Mount Moriah. And what is the temple? The temple is where sacrifices takes place, right? It, the sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins takes place. Is it possible that Jesus was ultimately sacrificed, you know, at a place which was designated to be where God would provide the provision of forgiveness for sins? All right. Uh, so uh, these are some interesting thoughts we could glean from this particular uh, chapter. Uh, it seemed very clear to us that Abraham and Isaac point them point beyond themselves. They point beyond themselves to the Messiah. All right. But before we we do a conclusion, let me just give some reflections. I just uh, just to make it a little bit more personal for us. I mean, these Bible studies should not just be, uh, you know, academic. I would like it to be more than just academic. Uh, is there something we can, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, bring some application to us in our own lives? And I want to offer you three uh, reflections that I have. Maybe you have some more and I'll be happy to hear some. But let's look at the first one. Notice in the scripture, uh, in the narrative that we read, it says, I know that you fear God. Talking to Abraham, God is saying, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. All right. This is uh, God telling Abraham how pleased he was with the trust that he placed in God. Right. Uh, just, just switch it. God is talking about Abraham. Now you switch it to God himself. Right? God seemed to be so sure of Abraham. Now if you switch it, can we be so sure of God? That God would not spare his only son for us. Right? Uh, because in 1 John 3 verse 16 it says, This is how we know what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. So if you look at the scripture, we can apply it to Abraham, but can we apply it to God? That we can be so sure that God will redeem us, will provide a sacrifice for us that will bring redemption to the whole world. And so the reflection I would like to offer us is, if we ever struggle about God's intention for us as his children, whether he will save us. Maybe we should read the story of Abraham and Isaac. That God declares his confidence in Abraham. Can we similarly have a similar confidence in God? That indeed he has provided for us a sacrifice that has taken away the sins of the world. And that is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the first reflection I'd like to offer you. A second reflection. Notice. We know that Isaac willingly lies down as the sacrifice. He chooses to be the sacrifice. I, I'm not sure how Isaac, how old Isaac was. I don't know if the narrative says that. But he could have easily wrestled with his father. He could have run away. 
he could have uh, overpowered his father and said, I'm not going to be the sacrifice. <laughs> but why does he just simply lay down and say, yes, father, I will honor your will. Does that ring a bell for us, right? Um, he submits, he trusts his father. And Jesus also willingly takes up the cross and becomes a sacrifice for us. And of course, the famous words of his in the Garden of Gethsemane, not mine, but your will be done. So what I want, uh, the reflection I offer here is, it's a story of trust. Our Christian story is also one to be of trust. We have to trust God in everything and anything. Can we? Right? That's a reflection that perhaps we can have. And the third one, the last one is this. And uh, I quote from Brown Michael in a book that he wrote answering Jewish objections to Jesus. Apparently, this account uh, was, uh, you know, uh, was part of a traditional Jewish prayer, right? In other words, the Jews continued to uh, uh, say something about this story about Abraham and Isaac, right? Apparently, the Jews would constantly ask, Israelites, the ancient Israelites, in their daily prayers would ask constantly, why did God ask Abraham to kill his son? And sadly, some of them even today do not know the answer. Right? Uh, is it possible that we could know the answer when we read the New Testament, when we come to Jesus? Right? Uh, the Jews are still floundering over the fact that who is the Messiah? But we have the fulfillment of this narrative, this prophetic enactment in Jesus Christ so perfectly. And we have the answer. Unfortunately, the Jews still struggle to exactly answer this question. Why did God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? Is it possible it's because Jesus, God wanted us to know that he would provide his own son for our uh, sins. And so uh, that is basically the study. But as I wind up here, uh, I just say that Abraham and Isaac, the story points beyond themselves to the Messiah as we have uh, so clearly recounted. This story is a, like I said, a prophetic enactment of the greater redemption God would someday accomplish through one of the descendants, you know, of Abraham. And that would be Jesus Christ, our Lord. So both Jesus and Isaac are long-awaited beloved sons. Both of them born miraculously. And there I submit my case that this is indeed prophetic of Jesus our Lord. Okay, the floor is open. Feel free to add some more thoughts, reflections. All right. Uh, Right. I did want to uh, mention that Franklin uh, talked about inspirational and infallibility. <laughs> so Franklin, if you have any thoughts on how you can connect the two uh, with, with the story, you are most welcome to add to whatever I said. Uh, sir, can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, Frank. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, maybe I should think it over and then answer. In the meanwhile, let me give others uh, the privilege of uh, posing their questions and comments. Certainly, yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, Sunimurti, could you <laughs> unmute yourself and uh, go ahead with your comment? For, for a Jew who was reading the 
Old Testament. Such a kind of interpretation would not have been possible for him to even to think. That is the feeling I get. That's very interesting. Uh, you say that it was just not possible. But if they read the New Testament and if they looked at Jesus, <laughs> probably they would have understood what was prophesied 3,000 years back. And I'm talking about Jesus' time. Uh, but yeah, that's a very interesting thought that you bring out. That they constantly ask the question, why, why, why? Why God did ask Abraham to sacrifice his son? Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't, uh, you know, recognize ultimately the answer 3,000 years later. <laughs> but the Jews don't accept the New Testament, right? Uh, yeah, they don't. Be that's because they reject Jesus as the Messiah. Yeah. Because of their rejection, they are unable to uh, recognize how the Old Testament has prophesied uh, this is to be the Messiah. Suri Murthy, go ahead. Not all Jews have rejected. Many oh, yeah. of the Jews have rejected. Yeah, of course. I mean, generally, yes. Yeah. The Messianic Jews, yes. Uh, many of the Jews have, right? Yes. Can I see? Uh, Bertram, go ahead. I've I've uh, read it somewhere, maybe in our church literature or maybe uh, some other source that Judaism, uh, uh, the you know, had its uh, you know importance and you know the religion they were you know everything you know they had a law structure and everything pointing to Christ, but yet they disbelieved him you know, and as Mr. Nagar questioned about uh, you know why they don't believe in the New Testament, uh, Mrs. and Mrs. Zechariah you told them, yeah, because of the unbelief. Okay. And uh, by the way, before I just continue, thank you so much for the very well presented, very, very effective uh, Bible study. I mean, you know, uh, prophecy enactment, you know, it's so true. And we all believing, we are, hope so we all believing and, uh, and are blessed with the grace and glory of God, okay, and believing and trusting. But my point is, I've read somewhere where Judaism is said to be another religion, like, you know, uh, because of their, you know, they're not being true to true to the teachings, you know, which God so lovingly present, you know, gave it to them, and which we call Judaism, you know, the Torah and the other things. But uh, because the unbelief, uh, uh, Mr. Zakar, you may just want to touch upon it and may want to elaborate on it. The Judaism, and I don't know whether other of our uh, brethren would want to think the same way. The Judaism is like a religion. Of uh, of like any other because of the unbelief, not for anything else. Because of the unbelief of uh, you know their written scriptures and because of the rejection of uh, you know of Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah, which you so beautifully presented. And uh, right. God bless you for it. But about Judaism, yeah. Thank you, Bertie. Uh, yeah, uh, I think you go, you went on mute. <laughs> uh, let me let me request um, uh, Suri Murthy make a comment and then maybe I'll try to answer. Yeah, go ahead, Suri. Judaism is not based on Old Testament alone. Mm. It is a mixture of two things. One is one is the uh, uh, written written version of the Old Testament. Another is a oral, oral version. Mishnah. So this is a mixture of two things. Uh, I think so you're that, referring... Yeah. That, that is why there are a lot of lies in Judaism, which Jesus was against. You're probably referring to the traditions, uh, the various traditions that... Uh, traditions, that is oral law. They said, God gave the law in the mountain, um, Sinai, one, one written law to Moses, another oral law through Moses. 
which was only through known only through the rabbis. Okay. So there was a privileged secret document which was not written down. I, I'm not they, they admit. It yeah. is admitted by them. I'm not saying something uh, which is not known. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. And to just to answer what Bertie said, Bertie, yes, you want to follow up? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you're on mute, Bertie, yeah. for, for some reason. Can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Yeah, uh, I just want to clarify what I mentioned. What I'm trying to say, Judaism uh, or the, you know, the which, uh, which uh, so, so about the oral and the written, you know, that uh, what the wonderful way that God dealt with them, you know, being in life. Yeah, you're going on mute for some reason. <laughs> uh... That's why. Yeah. Uh, 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 it's it's become a religion to them. It's more like a religion to them. That's what my point is. Okay. You know? Okay. Let, because let me, yeah, let me just. I mean, yeah, they've become a religion to them, like any other religion. You know? Where one would look at it as a religion, the way you know their disbelief and uh, you know their rituals, etc. Uh, the way I'll uh, the way I will look at it is is the following, and that is. It has become a religion, or rather, I should say, it has. They have made it into a religion. Actually, can I, can I, that's what, yeah, that's what I mean. It has become right. a religion. That's what I mean. Right. Yeah. Uh, God, when He dealt with the ancient Israel with Moses, uh, He was intend. He was intending for it to continue its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, and then carry forward. But True. the the but the ancient Israelites and the Jews that became the Jews now that we call them uh, made this into a religion and stopped at uh, you know uh, at Jesus. They did not want to believe Jesus. They did not. They are still waiting for a Messiah, and so yes. they have made it into a religion which God never intended. Uh, God Correct. wanted for it to move into the new covenant, but they stayed with the old. And that is yes. unfortunate that uh, they have lost the entire meaning of the old old covenant yes. and in its fulfillment in Christ, and what yes. ultimately it would all lead to the full the full uh, the full uh, fullness of the kingdom of God. They are yes. still they are still longing for a physical nation, and some yes. people believe that the physical nation was. Uh, established in 1947 as the modern state of Israel, which is uh, not, which is not a biblical uh, perspective at all. Most scholars believe that uh, God wanted to establish a fullness of the kingdom on, in the whole earth, not just uh, you know in in Judea. Okay. So that's how I would look at it. Any thoughts from anybody on this? Yes, uh, Rekha, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to talk about the horns, the the horns. Actually, uh, uh, it is, I think it, it also could mean that because Jesus uh, united heaven and earth together, like uh, uh, that could also mean that he was the only one and an embodiment in one ram, the heaven and earth have come together. And uh, therefore the angels and the people are, to, are in this. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's, that's very interesting. Right. About the two, you're talking about the two horns, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. Yes. Uh, I have one comment here. I think Sachin, you want to make a thought? Uh, let me just yeah, read this comment. Yeah. And then uh, uh, I think this is from Praveen. Uh, he says, Jews understood the same story in a more uh, New Testament Trinitarian perspective, but they did not want to relate it to Jesus. Yes. Okay. So what Praveen is saying is that they rejected uh, uh, Jesus. Praveen, I, as I mentioned, was not feeling too well, so he is, thankfully, he's still participating. Go ahead, Sachin. Uh, first of all, thank you for an excellent study. Uh, I thought of one scripture, but you, you brought the whole uh, chapter uh, into, into correlation, which was an amazing thing. We are thoroughly blessed. And if I just take it, uh, add it further, uh, it's it's in the word. Uh, it's in verse eighteen. It says, "And through your offspring, all nation on the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me." Right. So Christ is the fulfillment of all the promises God made to Israel, 
and through Christ, we as a Gentile, who Christ, who is the offspring of Abraham and David, through him, we who are the nations on the earth are blessed. So that's another thing that's, that Christ has fulfilled uh, by redeeming the Gentiles, the, the entire humanity. Right. And that promise was mentioned is in the verse 18. That's that's one thing. Yeah. Second is, uh, if we, I mean, there is a major belief that all the first four books are written by Moses. Mm -hmm. So, see his perspective when he would have penned down this story. Uh, and, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to him as he penned down each and every word. Uh, God will provide um, each and everything as they walk. Which means he... Uh, it's not just Abraham who had, but Moses also had a very thorough understanding of what he is penning down as the Holy Spirit was guiding him as he is putting down the story, exactly this chapter. So, right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah thanks for the reference, especially to the one on how God through Abraham will bring a blessing to the entire world. And obviously we see that that was the purpose through which, uh, you know, Jesus, of course, ultimately fulfilled it. Uh, but once again, that's a that's a pointing to the to Jesus, right? And so, yeah, that's wonderful. Right, just a few minutes left, and uh, any other thoughts you'd like to offer? Yeah. Right. Otherwise, thank you so much. It's uh, what a pleasure it is to. Yes, Bertie, you have a give you the last word. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you mentioned, Mr. Zechariah, that uh, you know, God inspired you to make this a series of uh, Bible studies. Wonderful, very good thing, and it will increase uh, uh, God is providing His grace and knowledge uh, in uh, through the studies. You know, uh, we are helped by all the speakers, and but <laughs> you being the main one, uh, could I? Uh, could you also in, uh, remember in the series? To show how the early church without the New Testament, now the New Testament is the biographies of Jesus Christ. Okay, the four, 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 four gospels and other writings are authoritative, and we, uh, it's everything to do, you know, with the Christianity living and living the kingdom base. How do these people? Maybe you may want to reflect and maybe have a Bible study on uh, how these apostles and all, all uh, you know, the early. Church, church leaders, the early church, how, uh, you know, the leaders, how they taught from the Old Testament about Jesus Christ, you know, because they didn't have the New Testament uh, ready at, uh, at that time, uh, uh, you know, during that uh, period. Uh, yeah. Maybe you want to, yeah, maybe you want to include that in the series of yeah. how they did, uh, how they did right. it. Let me just clarify first. Uh, when I said series, I don't want Sachin and Praveen to start rejoicing. That for the next for the next two months they don't have to do Bible studies. <laughs> no, when I said a series, whenever my turn comes, I will <laughs> I will take up you know these prophetic uh, you know situations. So that is what I meant by series. So it's not a continuous one, but uh, whenever my turn comes. Uh, okay. But on the other hand, yes, uh, you're talking about you see the Jesus Christ himself along with his disciples were conversant with the Old Testament. Right. Yeah. And so they quoted from the Old Testament. That is how we believe that we can take that as scripture because Jesus mentioned that as scripture. So, yes, so the Old Testament is scripture validated by Jesus and the apostles. Right. So, uh, and of course, and then as they started writing, like, for example, in Hebrews, the connection is so clear to Abraham, which I read for you in Hebrews 11. How the how Abraham, I mean, we are given clarity of how Abraham thought and how he connected resurrection and how God, you know, and God and Jesus Christ together. So uh, it, it's just amazing. Yeah, maybe we'll, we can look at that, uh, you know, specifically. Thank you. Okay. Okay, folks, thank you so much for your attendance. Uh, as uh, Sachin, I think, once said, it's, uh, it's always an encouragement for all of us to, uh, to do these studies, you know, when we have, uh, you know, people who are engaging and participating. It's just wonderful to see you all. So let's uh, go ahead and close. And uh, Manoa, if, if you're okay, and I'm not sure if you're on work now, 
but <laughs> but if you're okay, can you close us with prayer, please? Thank you. We can't hear you, Mano, for some reason. Uh, I don't know. Uh, did you? I mean, if you can just check your audio. Maybe it's your, uh, it's your, uh, what do you call it? Check if the voice is, uh, microphone is selected. Or no? Yeah, Mic the headphone. Ah, the no. mic of the headphone. Yeah, for some reason we can't hear you. That's okay. Uh, maybe we will queue you up for next time for prayer. Make sure your audio works. But uh, uh, Franklin Poppins, uh, is he, are you still here with us? Yes, you are. Can you kindly do the honors of closing in prayer, please? Thank you. Can you unmute? So can you hear me, sir? Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah. uh, Franklin, we can't hear you. <laughs> sir, now, sir, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes. Okay, okay. Our gracious Lord, our loving Father, we just bow our heads, Lord. And we want to give you thanks. Thank you so much, Father, for this day and for today's presentation. Thank you so much, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for, for being with our pastors and with all our members who are on Zoom today. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to come and make every effort, Lord, to understand and learn. Lord, to be sure, any prophetic statement or any prophet, prophetic enactment that is outlined way back in the mosaic writings, I believe are, are done under inspiration. It is not done through human intelligence or wisdom or knowledge. And to that extent, Lord, we rejoice and we give you thanks. Thank you, Father, for inspiring the writers to record something Maybe they did not understand it fully, but we in this posterity understand, Lord, and we rejoice and we give you thanks. Lord, thank you, Father, to know that your word is infallible and inerrant. Thank you so much, Father. Lord, we, I just pray, Lord, for all our members, all our pastors, and everyone who will be listening to this presentation, Lord, Give us a heart to come to you and trust you wholly and fully because, Lord, you are the one who reveals yourself to us. Fill us, Lord, with your love and we will learn to always trust in you, Lord, and allow your love to flow into us and to others. Thank you so much, Father. Be with all of us, Lord, as we disperse and meet the following week. Thank you so much, Father. We ask all this Lord, we especially want to remember the Jewish race. They still struggle with the question of who is Jesus and they have difficulty in accepting him as the Messiah. Lord, we pray for your grace for them. And in the fullness of time, surely, Lord, you will reveal yourself to them also, not only to them, but to all races, all peoples in this world. Thank you so much, Lord. We ask all this. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. amen.